prohibition cannot be enforced for the simple reason that the majority of American people do not want it enforced and are resisting its enforcement. That being so, the orderly thing to do under our form of government is to abolish a law which cannot be enforced, a law which the people of the country do not want enforced. We do not feel that private use or private possession in one's own home should have the stigma of criminalization. That the first law is in Europe and also here in the Americas was that you had to grow hemp. 1913 to 1917, individual cities in Texas caught that reefer madness notion. Insane reports, I mean just totally racist reports. They weren't issuing any of the, the licenses, they weren't issuing the permits. He challenged that, that it wasn't really a tax at all, that in fact it was a prohibition and the prohibition is unconstitutional. He won the court case and forced the federal government to provide him with marijuana. Can you imagine getting on an airplane with five tins of marijuana? So that patients had a safe access, they didn't have to buy on the streets from drug dealers, whoever that might be. I knew that the government had no right to demand blindness out of their citizens. We're still living in prohibitionary times today. Today it's drug prohibition. Why did they have to pass a constitutional amendment to make alcohol a prohibition? Because the federal government does not have the authority under the Constitution to prohibit anything. I don't really think people who smoke pot should be in jail. Mm, I can't say if I've ever had anybody violent with marijuana. Huh? And the guys on alcohol were more verbally abusive and almost violent. And if people are going to smoke marijuana, whether it's legal or not, I smoke every day. So I got a problem getting it. I got easy access. Because if this guy don't got it, I got this guy. This guy don't got it, this guy. You got this guy. And then I got about a dozen last resorts. So it's not like it's not going to be there. Well, the first laws regarding cannabis are very easy to identify because uh, cannabis had such a key role in society. Every Navy had to have hemp for its rigging. For centuries prior to about 1850, all the ships that sailed the Western Seas were rigged with hemp and rope and sails. Essentially what was going on was America needed hemp and the you know, the colonies really needed a whole lot of hemp for their own use. Uh, that the first laws in Europe and also here in the Americas, was that you had to grow hemp. Various kings and queens were constantly telling everybody, grow hemp, we really need this. And in fact, we'll fine you if you don't uh, grow a whole lot. And in the words of Thomas Jefferson, uh, hemp is a first uh, necessity for the commerce and marine and therefore to the wealth and protection of the country. There's no record that he did smoke marijuana. There are two things that make us a little suspicious. He wrote extensively about cannabis, but he did write in his diary, says that he separated the males from the females a little too late. There's some folks in the hemp industry who say, you know, the male plants are actually taller and stronger. If you're going for the stock, then you don't really want the plant to put as much energy into seeding. And so, you know, getting the males out of there might reduce the seeding for that. And that he could have been separating for hemp purposes that way and trying to keep the female plants from uh, essentially contaminating those. So he'd have more and more of a, a hemp field that would be usable for fiber and things along, along those lines. And the other thing that comes along is that he uh, was in communication with a doctor and he talked about a curious preparation of hemp from Silesia that he was interested in trying. Medical use tends to get attributed to uh, this Chinese emperor Shenang in 2737 BC. He prescribed it for things that people still use it for today, like arth arthritis and pain and uh, some neurological symptoms and some headache symptoms that uh, people still benefit from cannabis today. But in India, you know, they were using it for, uh, for different medical uses and uh, they brought it into the, the, the Greeks and the Romans. We also see a lot of medical use in ancient Roman texts. But once you get to the Romans, you get Galen, 
Pliny the Elder and these different people, then you have very distinct references to, to cannabis itself for medical purposes. W.B. O'Shaughnessy is a physician who was sent over to India. They found out that the, uh, the locals were using cannabis for a lot of different uh, medical uses, including spasms, including uh, you know, pain, including depression, including nausea, things like that. They had the Smith brothers in Scotland making cold syrups and stuff, and they found it was good for colds. So it was good for a lot of different things. From 1842 to 1900, cannabis made up one half of all medicines sold. From 1850 to 1937, the U.S. Pharmacopoeia listed cannabis as the primary medicine for more than 100 separate illnesses or diseases. There were a series of things that eventually laid the groundwork for the Marijuana Tax Act of 1937. There was a great deal of anti-Mexican sentiment that grew up around the turn of the century. Well, the same as we have this problem today where there's a lot of uh, prejudice and bigotry against immigrants here in California. 1913 to 1917, individual cities in Texas caught that reefer madness notion that Mexicans were going to smoke this and they wouldn't do their work right and they would rape white women or you know have super strength all these all these insane sort of yellow journalism tactics and so they weren't going to like go after these guys for the tequila because you know the Americans were drinking the tequila too but basically they wanted to blame it on something else and so the thing that distinguished them was that the Mexicans were also smoking marijuana and so they created this myth of the Mexican who would smoke marijuana and then start shooting up the town insane reports, I mean just totally racist reports, and all of these were associated with marijuana use by these terrible Mexicans. One of the most famous cases of that is this guy Victor Licata who apparently got high and then took an axe to his family. Here is the most tragic case. Yes, I remember. Just a young boy. Under the influence of the drug, he killed his entire family with an axe. He was a schizophrenic kid who had been put in insane asylum for many years because he was trying to attack his family and they let him out once and he killed his whole family. What they left out is this guy had a psychotic disorder, he had had schizophrenic breaks before, he had been really aggressive before, none of those things had been linked to cannabis. Harry Anslinger, who was the first drug czar, he was the head of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, basically uh, had been involved in alcohol prohibition. Just after uh, the 21st Amendment had been passed, which did away with alcohol prohibition, we fairly soon went into marijuana prohibition because we had this arsenal of people that wanted to prohibit something. They'd lost alcohol, so they went into marijuana. He had heard about some of these uh, cannabis laws down in Texas. The southwestern sheriffs especially sent him many, many, many documents, uh, police documents, stating that this Mexican or that Mexican had been caught with a knife and he was causing problems in a bar, or he stabbed somebody or he'd killed somebody or he'd gone berserk at the border and, and just kept coming across the border no matter how many times they fired at him. And went down, started planting stories in, in uh, various newspapers down there, including the Hearst newspapers. The thing you gotta know about Harry Anslinger is he was a frustrated fiction writer. You know, it, he wanted to write melodramas. Well, it, he was not successful in that career as a fiction writer, but he was a successful fiction writer pretending to tell the truth as a government bureaucrat writing about the dangers of marijuana making stuff up, putting it in, and, and one of the best examples of that is Marijuana, the Assassin of Youth, which he wrote, uh, which tells the story of a girl who jumps out of a window and commits suicide under the influence of marijuana. Well, he made it up. There was no such girl. Hearst owned newspapers and a whole lot of wooded land that he would, you know, use the wood to make the paper to print the newspapers on. It was a way of maximizing his profits. The Department of Agriculture was looking at potential markets for hemp, and they said, well, Basically, you get four times as much uh, product per acre on a sustainable basis out of hemp than you do out of forest land. If hemp had suddenly caught on as a source of paper, which it certainly has the potential to do, he would have owned all this woodland that would have been of less utility to him, and he would have been sunk. 
DuPont had developed this process for turning the wood into paper, which is not a particularly ecologically friendly one. It uses a lot of acids. It's kind of hard on the environment. And he also would have wanted to keep hemp from becoming uh, a major source of paper in the United States because he would have lost money in this same process. In order to really understand what happens there, you have to look at the DuPont a corporate report for 1935 and the report for 1937. The report for 1935 says that they're in serious financial trouble, that uh, they need a new markets, they need a new products. Then if you look at 1937, you see that they're much more upbeat. They think that they're going to be making progress. In fact, they say that in order to, that they predict that there will be a series of uh, legal changes that will force social and economic shifts in America. The revenue raising power of the government may be converted into an instrument for forcing acceptance of sudden new ideas of industrial and social reorganization. That's the same year that they passed the Marijuana Tax Act. And throughout the entire chemical industry, no name more honored than DuPont. Who is DuPont? DuPont, that same year, came up with uh, a patent for a nylon, a long synthetic fiber, direct competition against a long natural fiber, which is hemp. And so they created a whole market for themselves by doing that. Contributor of many products that make life more secure, more beautiful, more livable. The other thing that we found that really, I believe, solidifies the fact that this was indeed a criminal conspiracy at the top levels of government and industry are the reports from the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, Harry Anslinger, where he talked about the negotiations that he had to go through in order to get support for the Marijuana Tax Act. He had to go to companies like Sherman Williams and convince them to stop using hemp seed based oils and to use DuPont's products, the synthetic oils that DuPont was using for paint. We must also satisfy the canary bird seed trade and the Sherman Williams Paint Company, which uses hemp seed oil for drying purposes. We are now working with the Department of Commerce in finding substitutes for the legitimate trade. After that is accomplished, the path will be cleared for the treaties and for federal law. Harry J. Anslinger to Assistant Secretary of the Treasury. Anslinger Papers, Box 12, Penn State University. So essentially what he had to go from, and his records show this, was go from place to place convincing companies to stop using hemp and to replace hemp with DuPont products. At the same time as DuPont is writing his report saying that <laughs> the government could help them if it made a tax law that would change things like this. And so we see direct financial involvement. I mean, it's like the, a government agency lobbying for a corporation in order to give them business. And so it's alleged that he, Anslinger, and Hearst were all sort of in cahoots about this. Let's make this illegal. It'll benefit some of us economically. It'll keep other folks employed as drug czars. Let's, let's go for this. It's not as if we've got some letter from one of them to the other saying, let's do this. It's just sort of, when you put all the facts together, has a certain intuitive appeal. I'm still not willing to be convinced at this point. I haven't seen really any solid evidence other than the circumstantial evidence in the innuendo. These are the kind of things that they do on the golf course. Hey, I got a bill here in Congress that's going to do this. Oh, well, why don't you add a line about that? Well, okay. Might be true. Uh, they certainly did have the economic incentive, but the historical record um, isn't there.